Hi everyone and welcome to Training for Life Redeemed. I'm your host Dan, as always with my father David Jackson. Today we are continuing to work through the book of Matthew. We are almost done. We're halfway through chapter 27, Dad. The We've had Jesus go on his, uh, I'm not going to say trial, because we refuse to call it a trial, really, when he was yeah. in front of the chief priests and stuff. It's more of an interrogation that's happening there, so that they then can bring him to trial with a charge against him of uh, him saying that he's the king of the Jews, which then means that Pilate needs to kill him. And so Pilate is now handing Jesus over to the soldiers to get ready for his crucifixion. Yeah, And so we've got this... Uh, mocking happening, and then they're going to lead him out to the place of the skull, Golgotha. Dad, why is it important that we actually understand that the soldiers have him, that they're beating him up, that they're putting this um, you know, really thorny crown on his head and dressing him up in robes and stuff? Like, are they doing this publicly where it can be seen by everyone and it's kind of a shaming thing, or are they doing this privately, like in a prison area and it's... Yeah. Like, what's, what's, what's the significance here? here? Yeah. Um, the significance is that the Jews have insulted him, spat on him, uh, the Sanhedrin, that is, have insulted him, spat on him, slapped him in the f- punched him in the face uh, during his interrogation. And they've basically bullied the Roman governor into sentencing, handing him over. He actually hasn't issued a sentence. Pilate never sentenced him, never found him guilty, declared him innocent, but still handed him over to be killed. Yeah. Um, and when you hand somebody over to be killed, the only people who are allowed to do that are the Romans. So Jesus is taken from the hands of the Sanhedrin and the temple police and handed over to the Roman cohort. So now you have the garrison troops that are in in Jerusalem on full parade handed a replacement prisoner for execution. What I think we forget is Pilate had already scheduled the crucifixion of three terrorists. Yeah. And Jesus is now going to replace the chief terrorist. So the soldiers are all ready to march out and do the, the thing. Um... But now they have a new candidate. So the culture of a Roman army is fairly cruel. Um, And so as we go into the... It looks like the Praetorium here would be Herod's Palace. I say Herod's Palace because Herod built this building in Rome when he was Herod the Great, King of all Israel, effectively. Mm. And now the Romans have taken over that office and Pontius Pilate occupies that house. In the middle of that house, it's a rectangular palace, would be a courtyard, and they've taken Jesus into that courtyard uh, and are preparing him with the other two to head off. This mockery and this ridicule and this everything else is just part of the humiliation, and the scourging um, is also part of that. It, it, it reduces these terrorists to a quivering mass of misery um, and then puts that on parade. And the aim is to intimidate the Jewish population, the extra 50,000 men who are in town, and mm. say, don't start any trouble during the festival, boys, or you'll be up there with them. Yeah. So th- this whole parade is all about making that point. But in terms of God's plan... The bit that I still marvel at is that if you read Psalm 22, Psalm 69, these guys are following God's script. Yeah, it's all written down a thousand years earlier. It's, you know, it's and it's it's not written down originally for Jesus. It's written down because that's David's experience, and it's the experience of all of God's people. We will be surrounded by dogs. We will be and bulls, and they're all going to be tearing at us because we are serving Christ the King and not their King. So, Yeah, so then Jesus is going to get taken outside of the city because we don't crucify people inside the city. No, that would make the city unclean. That's right, so we go outside the city, up onto a little hill. We're going to crucify him on a hill that looks like a skull or something like that. Uh, It's called Golgotha. 
And I'm going to put up the sign that says... Jesus is the king of the Judeans. The no, Judeans, not the Jews. Yeah, he's king of the of the province of Judea. Yeah, yeah. According to the Roman soldiers. According to the Romans, because <laughs> that's their province. Yeah, but then yeah. later on, if we keep reading, we're going to see that the people who are mocking Jesus are going to say, "Oh, you say you are the king of the Israel, the king of the whole nation, yeah. of Israel." And so, yeah. there's clearly a differentiation there. Where there is, They've charged him with being the king of the Jews too, haven't they? They haven't charged him with claiming to be the king of Israel, is that right? They've charged him with claiming to be a king, and Caesar is the only king. Yeah. Okay. So what they're saying is he is claiming to rule Judea, which means the Roman governor. Yeah. So this is treason. Even though he's not from Judea in any way. <laughs> yeah, but it, so this is the you want a Roman charge to get a Roman governor to order a Roman execution. Yeah, it's got to be a Roman crime, but the Messiah is King of Israel. So yeah, so these guys are then going to, well, the, the Jews who come along are going to mock Jesus while he's on the cross. We have oh. uh, mocking happening from various people, including chief priests and stuff, who they're going to say stuff about whatever he can save these people. He can't yep. save himself, uh, whatever. Jesus is then going to get to the point where he cries out and says, uh, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. Yep, hopefully I pronounced that decently. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which is essentially quoting the first verse of Psalm 22. Yes. So I remember finding this out and then going back to Psalm 22 and just going, oh my goodness, this is crazy. How do they not hear Jesus saying this line of what is generally a famous psalm? Like Jews are singing psalms. Yeah. relatively frequently they should remember that right it's kind of like when you're listening to your favorite song and you get one line of it and then you automatically are singing the rest of it yeah you would expect them to sing the rest and go all oh, right yeah okay yep uh maybe maybe this is him <laughs> like he's fulfilling everything that's in that psalm as he's quoting it yeah uh but they think he's calling elijah to come and rescue him yeah i think i'm speculating a little bit here but I would have expected if Jesus was going to sing a song on the cross, um, and let me say Psalm 22, if you're going to sing Psalm 22, you want to set it to music like heavy metal. Yeah. Uh, it, this is not your standard organ piece. You know, it's not for the church rock band to play, you know, happy clappy music. This is heavy metal. This is a guy dying in agony screaming. But what's in, what I think is interesting is that he doesn't quote the psalm in Hebrew. He's from Galilee. Galileans speak the language of the Gentiles as well as Hebrew. And he's chosen in Jerusalem in front of the Bible experts to quote it in Aramaic. And they're listening to a Galilean with a Galilean accent speak Aramaic not Hebrew, they know the song in Hebrew. So it did obviously it didn't twig with them that that was the first line of Psalm 22. Yeah. But then when you look at the psalm, oh my goodness. So if we take this, if we just take that line as it sits there and we don't look at the psalm at all, oh my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You would think God had forsaken him. Yeah, and, yeah, and, and that's what a lot of churches like. You'll hear it; it's in lots of songs. Yeah, you know, father turning his face away, and you know, God not watching his son die. Yeah, but, God turns his back, and the son's abandoned, and all this sort of language. But Jesus is announcing a song. He's on the cross because he's obeying the Father. This is the Father's will. He has the Father's approval for what he's doing. This is the plan. He is in the father's eyes, a great hero hmm. for laying down his life to save the people that God loves and has chosen to save. Yeah. So when he asks this question, he's not sitting there going, oh, how did I get here? Well, you know, what, God, did you forget me? He, that's not what he's doing. He's doing, in many ways, a lot of what Job did. Um, Let's put the question out there. Let's look at the question so that we start to understand what the answer is. So we read through Psalm 22 and you get, commit yourself to the Lord, let him deliver him, let him rescue him because he delights in him. 
and the crowd are standing there saying, oh, let's see if Eli will come down and rescue him if he delights in him. Funnily enough, <laughs> twice the scribes and the Pharisees say, if he is the son of God, and that's word for word what Satan said in the temptations, mm -hmm. if you are the son of God. Yeah, throw yeah. yourself down and God will come and rescue his angels. And... Yeah, they're echoing their boss. So, I mean, then you get lines like, um, you are the one who brought me forth from the womb. You make me trust on my mother's breast. Upon you I was cast from birth. You've been my God from my mother's womb. Uh, I'm poured out like water. My bones are out of joint. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. Dogs surround me. They pierced my hands and feet. Yeah, dice. Um, can they throw, cast lots for my clothes? <laughs> I, count, I can count all my bones. Yeah. So when you get to the Lord's Supper, don't say his body was broken for you. It wasn't. Um, you know, the bread is broken, but not the body. The body is one. Dogs surround me. They pierce my hands. Feet. I count my bones. They divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothes. Hmm. I mean, goodness, it's all there. But here's the punchline. Verse 24, Psalm 22. He has not despised nor abhorred the afflictions of the afflicted, nor has he hidden his face from him. But when he cried to him for help, he heard. Yeah. And the answer to that cry, Psalm 22 on the cross, is the resurrection. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's very important too with the whole process of what's happening with Jesus on the cross to understand that this is him taking the wrath of God. Yeah. And so... I don't really see how God's going to do that without looking. Like, if it's God's wrath, it's God's judgment that he's taking. And yeah. God has to be present for that. Like, it's... Yeah, you, you don't split God mm. into two parts. This is all of God, all of Jesus, dying according to the will of the Father, you know, still empowered by the Holy Spirit to go through all this. You know, this is a, this is a one God act. Um, and it has the father's approval Ooh. so and it has the son's obedience uh, I mean it's, it's all there what is it that saves us what saves us is the fact that he died he actually died and so we have the witnesses there Ooh. with all the mocking going on but the witnesses are there to confirm he died and then we've got to look at who are the witnesses well they're girls <laughs> Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and John, James and John, yeah. yep. And yeah, these are women who have been travelling with Jesus and supporting him the whole way yep. through. And, and I feel like for Western church history, <laughs> yep. we have a very large emphasis on Jesus' death. Yep. Uh, for the Eastern church, it's a much larger emphasis on his resurrection. <laughs> <laughs> Christos and Esti. That's right. <laughs> and I'm not... I'm, like, I just find it interesting that that's what's happened yeah. but why is it so particularly like this is Jesus fulfilling a lot of prophecy there's Jesus doing everything but really like the the main thing that's going to happen like the reason why Jesus is triumphant and all this stuff is his resurrection that comes yes. at the end that's what brings all the hope and everything and the joyful aspects yeah. of what's going on and you can't have that without the death happening obviously and it's interesting in Matthew uh, in fact in all the gospels one of the things that surprised me a little bit is that you notice how casually we're told that he's crucified. You, you, there's no description of how many lashes he got or how he bled or, you know, how many times he screamed. This is not... Um, it's not the crucifixion? It's something like that. Mel Gibson did it. Yeah. Um, and it was all the about... Passion. The passion. The passion. The passion of the Christ. And it was all, you know, vivid camera work of every bit of skin that came off and all the suffering... And there's lots of pious meditations on, you know, every wince of pain that went on. And we just use our imagination and fill this thing up because we're obsessed with obscenity. Mm. And you notice that Matthew, Mark, Luke, they almost just matter-effectively just say, yeah, he was crucified. Yeah. 
Only time there's any kind of mention of blood and guts and stuff is when they're checking that he's dead. <laughs> they're checking that he's dead and he's, he's whole, his bones aren't broken. Yeah. You know. But we've got to pierce him with a spear and see blood and water. Which, yeah. <laughs> the blood and water is to prove that he's dead. Hmm. Um, without the shedding of blood, there is no guaranteed that the life has been drained. So we've got witnesses. Matthew mentions the women that are standing at a distance. John mentions the women little party that are standing right at the foot of the cross talking to him mm. as he reaches, speaks down and says, John, look after my mother. Um, that's a fairly intimate conversation. But there's also the Roman soldiers. If anybody knows that somebody was dead, yeah. <laughs> these guys have seen enough dead bodies. They're the ones that shoved the spear in and their reaction is, here's the Jewish authorities, if you're the son of God, and here's the Romans who actually killed him saying, yeah, he mm -hmm. is. Yeah, and that doesn't just come, like, Matthew doesn't even mention the spear, I don't think. No. But it comes after, Matthew mentions a whole bunch of other stuff, which people kind of question because it's only mentioned in Matthew. Yeah. And it's also extra um, powerful, I guess, I'd say supernatural in the sense that, uh, of what normal people would think it's called. But when you have earthquakes with resurrections from the dead, and all that kind of, what happened to these people dad they were resurrected from the dead what happens to them afterwards do they then die again do yeah. they go back to just go back and La fall back asleep Lazar <laughs> Lazarus is raised from the dead yeah a couple of weeks earlier these guys pop out and they are they are a sign to the community to say you got this wrong mm. um, you have an earthquake you have two earthquakes you have darkness for six hours anybody with any memory of the Egyptian plagues yeah any of the prophecies Jesus made about judgment coming yeah any Roman who believed in omens and superstition <laughs> they're all going to be panicking because this is the central event of history um, and the most powerful thing that's happening here is death is defeated so we have witnesses that death is defeated uh, as well as having Jesus rise from the dead. But when he rises, it's a different body. Hmm. But we'll get to that. We'll get to We'll that. get to resurrection <laughs> next week. Thank you guys so much for coming and joining us. If you enjoyed the episode, you want to come and grab the study notes to go along with this episode, head over to trainingforliferedeem.com slash 86. If you enjoyed it, hit the uh, review button and give us five stars. Leave a comment as well. <laughs> and then hit the subscribe button so you come and join us again next week when we finish off the rest of chapter we've got, 27. We've got two more sessions. We do. We do. We've got to do his burial, resurrection, and then we'll talk about the Great Commission as well. Yep.